All right, good morning, everyone. Welcome to today's sermon, Living to Please God. We're going to be going through 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses, eight, or verses 1 through 8. But I just have a few announcements before we get started. Um, we're going to be packing for Christmas child boxes uh, November 21st, right after church. And so if you want to be a part of that, please come here. And if you want to help uh, with putting everything together, please call the office and it would let us know. Children's Christmas plays the Sunday, December 19th, and we'll also be sent, uh, doing hot cinnamon rolls at 9 a.m., and then the service in the gym, the worship will start at 9.30. And then one last announcement I want to make is there was a concert here, but the Have You Heard concert has been canceled, um, and they're going to reschedule that, reschedule that, so please look forward to, um, please look to the uh, bulletin or also online for further updates on that. Well, let us pray and then we'll get started. Father, I thank you for opportunity to dive into your word. I pray that as we read it, that we would uh, be conscious of what you're trying to tell us in your scripture, that we would evaluate our lives on what pleases you and what doesn't please you, God, that's in our lives. I pray that as we go through it, that you would uh, humble us and that we would grow closer to you. I pray for those who are sick or not able to make it. I just pray you be with them and encourage them and help them to know that you are with them and that you have a plan for them, God. I thank you for all that you do. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, let's start with our main Bible passage today, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 1 through 8. As for other matters, brothers and sisters, we instructed you how to live in order to please God, as in fact you are living. Now we ask you and urge you in the Lord Jesus to do this more and more. For you know what instructions we gave you by the authority of the Lord Jesus. It is God's will that you should be sanctified, that you should avoid sexual immorality, that each of you should learn to control your own body in a way that is holy and honorable, not in passionate lust like the pagans who do not know God, and that in this matter no one should wrong or take advantage of a brother or sister. The Lord will punish all those who commit such sins. As we told you and warned you before, for God did not call us to be impure, but to live a holy life. Therefore, anyone who rejects this instruction does not reject a human being but God, the very God who gives you his Holy Spirit. So a little bit of a background of what's kind of going on in this letter and why Paul wrote this letter is you, I encourage you guys to read Acts chapter 16 and 17 and 18 if you want a little bit more background. In fact, I usually encourage people now that when they read an epistle from Paul, usually you can find out what was going on and why Paul wrote that letter, a lot of it from in the book of Acts. You can kind of see what God was doing through Paul and what where God was telling Paul to go. Well, here we see that in Acts, we get the information that God gave a vision to Paul for him to go to Macedonia. And then, so Paul gets up and he, and he travels to Macedonia with Silas and Timothy. And first, uh, Paul stops in Philippi, and, he's, and he kind of has a rough time. He kind of gets beat up, and then he makes his way to Thessalonica. And there, the, he starts preaching, and people accept Jesus. And there he builds a really good bond and uh, relationship with them. And, he's, and it says that he labors day and night with them. But he was only there for three weeks. It wasn't a long time, but in the, in the letter, in the first couple chapters, Paul kind of covers all the different areas that he addressed with them. He taught them a lot of stuff in those three weeks. But then some of the Jews there, they didn't like the, what Paul was doing. So they went to the marketplace, they, they kind of created a, a mob, and then they went after Paul. Well, they didn't find Paul, and so Paul was in, uh, ended up escaping that night, and he ended up going to Berea. 
And so when he was at Bree, he started teaching and uh, setting up a, a church there. But the Jews from Thessalonica, they realized that, hey, Paul's down there preaching. So some of them went down and caused the same issue for Paul. So they ended up smuggling him out, and they ended up going to Athens. Well, while he was at Athens, him, he sent Timothy back to Thessalonica because he was really concerned about what was, how they were doing and, and how, um, what he had taught them, if they had stuck or not. And so he sent Timothy, Timothy back, and so as he was in Athens, then he continues on and he goes to Corinth. Well, at this time, Paul had been kind of beat up and, a lot and pursued and hated. And so God says, don't worry, preach the gospel, don't be afraid for he had many people in the town. So Paul had actually ended up staying there for a year and a half in Corinth. Well, during this time, Paul comes back to report to, to Saul. Timothy comes back to report to Saul that, you know, they're doing really well, but there's a few areas of their culture that's seeping in to their church life. And so Paul, concerned, writes this letter, starts off with encouraging them, and then here in this chapter, he kind of starts pointing out some of the things that they need to fix, that they need to change. And so one of the things that they point out is, that Paul points out, is that the sexual immorality or the lust or the desire to please the flesh has, had kind of grown, had kind of been seeped in from the culture that was around them. But I want to ask you, do we face the same problems? Does our church as a whole, or even this church, do we have things that are part of the culture that would not please God that are becoming a part of our church? What about in your own life? Are there things in your life that are things of the world that go on in your life that would not please God if you thought about it? As we go through these passages, I want us to look at what the goal of Paul was in saying and what he was saying to the believers in in Thessalonica and see if we can be encouraged and given insight on how we should live and how we should think. There's four words and that I want us to kind of focus on as we go through these passages. I can't we, we can't hit every single part of what Paul's talking about today. But I want to reveal what God spoke to me, um, and I want to talk about what these four words, sanctified, holy, pagans, and reject. As we read read through, we'll go through it. We'll talk about those words. But the theme is here in verse 1, and he says, as for other matters, brothers and sisters, we instructed you, and this is the theme, how to live in order to please God. Did you know that you could please God? Some people think that they can't because God knows everything, so why would he be pleased? He would just, he would already know it. But here in Scripture, it says that we can please God, just like we can also invoke God's anger by how we live, by the things that we do. And we see this in the, throughout Scripture. We see this in Moses. He was hitting He was in charge of leading the Jews, and they were getting close to going into the promised land for the 40 years had almost been up that they had spent. And he was just pretty close to the promised land, but he misrepresented God by hitting the rock twice. And as a result, God said, you misrepresented me, and so you will not be entering the promised land. But I'll take you up on a mountain, and you can see the promised land from afar. And so Moses went up, and he was able to see the promised land. But shortly after that, Moses passed away. So even God's anointed can invoke God's anger and judgment. We see this in Saul also. Saul was the first king of the Jews, and he had walked away from God. And as a result, God said, okay, I'm going to end your rulership. And David is going to take your throne. So we need to be careful on how the choices that we make in life. Because they're either going to anger God or they're going to please God. And Paul is encouraging the Thessalonians that we need to make sure that we're living in a life and a way that pleases God. But the first word that we're going to be focusing on is sanctified. 
Here in verse 3, it says, it is God's will that you should be sanctified. So what does sanctify mean? It's throughout Scripture, this word is used a lot. It means to be set apart, separate, or sacred. Things in the Bible that God has made holy are objects. The temple and the things in the temple were holy. The Ark of the Covenant was holy. And if we misrepresent the things that God declares holy, there's going to be penalties. There was a man who, when they were transporting the Ark of the Covenant, he had slipped. He was walking by, and he, was, and he slipped, and he put his hand on the Ark to catch himself. But as soon as he touched it, because he had touched it in an improper way, not in the way that God described, the man fell down dead. Places that God has made, has sanctified, is Mount Sinai. He made the place holy when he gave the Ten Commandments to Moses. He has also made his temple holy. Times, God has made the Sabbath and other times in his, throughout history and, and times to come. In days to come, there will be holy times as well. And God has also, or sanctified, and that God has also sanctified people. Jesus spoke of himself as being sanctified in John 17, verses 18 through 19. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. For them I sanctify myself, and, for, and that they too may be truly sanctified. Jesus was sanctified. He was set apart. And his followers are to be set apart from sin and for God's use. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 16, or 15 and 16, it says, But just as, the, just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, Be holy because I am holy. For, it, for something to be sanctified means that it is set apart for a purpose. You are sanctified. You are set apart from this world by God. You are not sanctified by your own work, but by the grace and love of God. We're not to do things that the world does. We're not to try and be a part of the world as we used to be. Because God has called us to be different, to be like him and not like the world. So, okay, so I'm sanctified. That means I'm set apart. Does that mean I just, I wait until God comes back or until God takes me? No, that's not what Paul's talking about. That's just the beginning of what he's addressing. Some people, though, we act that way, it seems like. They're like, you know, God set me apart, and I'm just kind of waiting until he takes me home. But the next word that we're going to be talking about explains what we do after we're sanctified. When we accept Jesus into our heart, we're at that moment, we are sanctified. We're set apart as to be his children. And so the next word that I want us to look at is in verse 4. That each of you should learn to control your own body in a way that is holy. But what does holy mean? We read it in scripture. We sing it in songs. But if someone was to ask you, what does holy mean? What would you tell them? I think there's two parts of this holiness discussion that I want to address today. First, I want us to look at what is God's holiness? God's holiness is absolute perfection. God's holiness shapes all of his attributes. His love, his mercy are holy, and even his anger and his wrath is holy. God is perfect in all that he does and all that he is. There is no imperfection in him, and there's no sin found in him. We can't fully understand God's holiness, because to do so would be to fully understand God. But we do know from Scripture that God's holiness is perfect and right, and there is nothing wrong with it. But I want us to talk about the other area of holiness. I want us to talk, what does it mean for us who are not God, to be holy. We're sanctified, we're set apart for a purpose. But holiness is that purpose in life, is 
the reason why we're sanctified, the reason why we're set apart. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 13 through 16, Peter writes to believers, Therefore, prepare your minds for action. It's not a state of being, but it's what we do. And he continues on, Keep sober in spirit. Fix your hope completely on, gra- on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the former lusts which were yours in your ignorance, but like the Holy One who called you. Be holy yourselves also in all your behavior, because it is written, You shall be holy, for I am holy. Peter is quoting from Leviticus chapter 11, verse 44, and Leviticus chapter 19, verse 2. Sometimes, as Christians, we stick to the few verses, to the verses that we know, or passages, or even sometimes books that we know because we're comfortable, and we like the theme and message in there, and there's nothing wrong with that. But there's so much of God revealed in all of Scripture. We need to make sure that we're reading God's Word, not just the parts that we like, but we need to be reading all of God's Word, because it reveals who he is, and it also reveals what he desires for us, his children. To be holy means that what we do pleases God. It reflects his character and his will. Paul is telling the Thessalonians, if you have received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, that you are sanctified, and as a result of your sanctification... You are not to be of this world, but to be of the family of God. Since you are set apart, you are to act like it. Me included. This is what it means for us to be holy, to do the things in life that pleases God and God alone. Not to put our own desires before God or others. Everything we do, we should ask, would this please God? That's a hard question because it means we'd have to evaluate everything we do in life. Paul starts off with saying, talking about sanctified, how we're set apart, and how we're to, as we're set apart, how we're to conduct our lives and how we're to live by talking about what is holy and that we need to be holy in order to please God by what we do. But then he goes on to the opposite, the contrast. He talks about pagans and reject. Those are the words I want us to focus on. Here in verse 5, it says, not in passionate lust like pagans. But what does pagans mean? There's many definitions of what the word pagan means. If you ask a Muslim, if you ask a, a Jew, if you ask a Hindu, you'll get different answers based on their point of view from their religion. But from what Paul is getting at, what Christians would have understand then and what it it means to us, I found that this definition of what a pagan is is probably the best definition. And I'll read it twice just so that we get an understanding of it. So it says, a sensual gratification and a self-indulgence and the pursuit of happiness and pleasure to the exclusion of everything else. Here it is again. Sensual gratification and self-indulgence and the pursuit of happiness and pleasure to the exclusion of everything else. If I find that the things in my life that I am doing reflect the pagan lifestyle rather than the one of holiness, then I am not living to please God. The Bible gives us this warning in Philippians chapter 2, verse 12. Paul says, Continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. We are not to take for granted what Jesus did for us, the relationship that we have entered in with him. And we're not to take for granted God's mercy and love. The next word I want us to focus on is the word reject. 
in verse 8. It says, Therefore, anyone who rejects this instruction does not reject a human being, but God, the very God who gives you His Holy Spirit. So what does reject mean here in this passage? What is Paul getting at? Paul is teaching the Thessalonians that this teaching is not from man, but from God. Paul goes on to point out that God who sanctified you and me is working in you to produce holiness through your life of obedience is the very one that lives in you. It is not, the son, it is not some distant God or object. God has joined himself with you and lives in you. When we sin, we grieve and insult the sanctifying spirit of God. The, source, the sources of the, of the believer's new life is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is like the fountain of God. That same fountain is in you, and sin and the holiness of God are not compatible. Paul's letter should challenge the way that we live, should challenge the way that we think. We should not be thinking, how close to the edge can I get before I sin? But, ra but rather, would this please God? Will God be glad that I am doing this? If not, then what should I be doing about it? If I am doing something in my life, and I know God will not be pleased, then why am I doing it? Our thoughts should not be, how close to the edge can I get before I sin? But rather, will this please God? We should always be seeking the will of God. If we think, I'm going to do my stuff first and then I'll get to God's agenda today, instead of thinking, God, I'm going to put you first. I'm going to put what would please you. Because if we think about me first, then we're not living to please God, and our focus is not on God. But when we put God first, we're focusing on God and God alone. When we focus on God and God alone, then we get rid of all the sin and just the yuckiness that goes along with it in our lives. And also our life is also easier. We worry less and we, and we don't have as much busyness in our lives. We focus more on time and energy and on the things we, ha we can focus more time and energy on the things that God wants us to do. It is easier to find rest and be rested. A life focused on pleasing God is a life full of joy and love and love for God and others. doesn't mean we don't have struggles but you can have joy in the midst of struggles. You can't have happiness, but you can have joy. You can rejoice in your walk in relationship with God. Our God desires as Christians, our desire as Christians should be to please God. If we look at our culture today in America, the beginning of our founding, it wasn't perfect. And there was a lot of issues all the way up until now. But you can see that the last couple generations, there's been a great increase in the things that are unholy and unpleasing to God. And so as we evaluate the culture that we live in today, it's even getting worse and worse. But as we evaluate our culture, as we evaluate our church what is in our church that pleases God? What is in our church that doesn't please God? And in order to help fix those things, first we need to focus on ourselves. So my challenge to you this week is, what is in your life that pleases God? And celebrate those things and do it more and more, as Paul encourages the Thessalonians. But the harder part of this week's challenge is what is in your life that does not please God. 
And if this is something that you can't stop on your own, that you've struggled with, please reach out to a friend. Me and Darren, Pastor Darren, are here. We'd love to help you and talk with you and maybe even pair you up with someone that can encourage and challenge you if you don't know anyone. If you know someone in, that's a spiritual leader in your life or that you see someone in the church, you're like, hey, I can reach out to this person. Do so. We're not called to do this on our own. We're called to be in fellowship with one another, to bear one another's uh, burdens and to confess sins to one another. So my challenge to you this week is what is in your life that pleases God and what is in your life that does not please God and what are you going to do about it? Let us pray. Father God, I thank you for this opportunity. I thank you for your word. I pray that we would be obedient in evaluating what you have to say about us and implementing what you want us to do about the things that don't please you. But God, I pray that you help us to focus more and more on things that do please you. Not to focus on the bad stuff, but to have the mind that always focus on what is pleasing to you and to focus on just doing those things. And I pray that those who are not able to make it to church, whether physical issues um, that they may be having or um, various other reasons, God, I pray that you would encourage and strengthen those in our congregation, those in our community, and I pray for our government, both the local and the state and the federal government, God, and I pray that you would rise up godly leaders, that you would give wisdom to our leaders, and that those who do not know you, that you would draw them closer to you so that they may have an opportunity to be in a right relationship with you and to make the decisions for our nation and our local people that would honor and uplift your holy word. Thank you for all that you do. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, hope you guys have a good week and praying for you guys and look forward to seeing you guys in church soon. All right.